Okay, so after the war, you went to work in private industry and you somehow ended back up in Hanoi in 1994? That's, that's right. And uh, th this is a continuation of the slide presentation. This is the second half of the story. As, uh, since I was in Hanoi, Sante was beckoning me one more time. I had to go out and see what it looked like in the daytime. To keep in mind, we were over across it at night one time, and that was uh, very quick, very brief. And then some people have asked me, why would you want to go back to a place that you wanted to leave in such a big hurry? Mm -hmm. Well, because peace had bro broken out over Vietnam, and I just wanted to see what it really looked like uh, in the daytime, on the ground, with a camera. And that's why we have these pictures. Did you have an opportunity to talk to Vietnamese people about what they remembered about the raid? Yes, in a roundabout, unplanned way, which I'll, I'll, I'll show you as we get into this. Okay. So, this is, this is a picture now of the two cells there. The, the helicopter actually landed right in this area here. Uh, this is an isolation confinement cell. I'll, I'll show you a better picture of that. You can see it there. It looks, it looks about the size of a telephone booth, which it was. There are no ventilation holes up on top here. It was all solid concrete. That door would close. and. Prisoners were put in there for three main reasons, uh, and they were all catch-alls. The first one was you didn't bow deep enough or to their satisfaction to the guards. Number two, you didn't salute their officers properly. And the big one that put you in there for good time, like the time, was being caught communicating. That could either be talking, or there's a tap code, which I'll show you later, uh, any of those were, were strictly enforced and they put you in this, close the door, and you were in there anywhere from a week, two weeks, to two months, three months. And it was, you know, one of those, those things for misbehaving. And when I was there, you see this little pan here. There was a three-legged pig running around the pen and I assumed that was his home now. And that's where they fed him and, and gave him the water and everything. So I, I was... Uh, Thinking ahead, I had a, a, a local national with me for the language barrier so he could speak if we need to talk, which we did to find Sante going out there uh, in a cab. We had to ask directions and I went out there in, in just pure blind faith because I didn't even know if Sante existed then, if it was plowed under or whatever. And as the closer we got to Sante, uh, I could hear from the questions and, and what we had to do to find it, that it was still there, because everybody knew they'd, when, they, when they were asked, they'd immediately point, oh yeah, it's over there, this were is there good. Were people living there? Well, if that comes out here later on. Uh, so, so anyway, we, 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 we get in here, and, and uh, I, I said to, the, to the, uh, the, the native, I said, uh, the interpreter, you know, that's one of those pigs, you know, being a three-legged pig. I said, what do you think happened? And, and I'm setting him up. And he said, oh, you know, here in Vietnam, uh, they have many poisonous snake. And I'm, we're sure maybe a snake bit his leg and he lost his leg. And I looked at I said, no, no, no. I said, you have, have it wrong here. That's one of those pigs that was so good, they didn't want to eat them all at one time. And he yuck, chuckled a little bit, and then we were good. Keep in mind, I could not tell him what I had done back in Sante originally. So I had to do it in like a third person, what happened here, and I got bits and pieces. He never heard of it either, by the way. There's, there's, there's two generations, three generations removed from the Vietnam War. That for them is now ancient history. And it's not an American war. It was, it was a, a spin-off from the French in their colonization days. So we were there just helping the Vietnamese, and they do not have any grudges that way. Uh, they knew we were flying up there. They have a, a peace guard, and I'll show you a picture later, of all the airplanes and some of the airplanes they shot down. But there is an American. They actually like us. They really do. They want us to come back. Uh, just just for, for everything, for the, the technology. And if you look today, you go in, you can get shirts that are made in Vietnam. There's some, some products made. Uh, check some of the supermarkets. There's seafood from Vietnam. They, they have it labeled. So they've, they've come a long way. So anyway... I said communication was one. This is the, the tap code that they used. Now notice there's only 25 letters, five across, five down. There's one missing letter and that's the K. And that's so you could do it, 25 
letters, five and five. Otherwise, it'd be 26 letters. So it's a phonetic alphabet in that you use the C for the K if you're going to spell out a long word. What, what they found there, they used a lot of abbreviations. Uh, I'll, I'll show you what I'm talking about here. Uh, let's say you wanted to communicate to a, a prisoner in the next cell. They, they had uh, tin cups and they'd wrap them up in some cloth so it would be a muffled tap. So if, let's say you want to say hi to the next prison. The first thing you would do, you would hear a... When the prisoner in the next cell was ready to communicate, he'd come back with a two bits. He's ready to talk. So if you wanted to talk and say hi, what you, think of this like a typewriter. It's across and it's down. So what you would do, you would hear two taps. That brought you down to the second line. Then you'd hear a tap, 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 pause, tap, 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 four taps. You just spelled out H, three taps, I, four taps, H-I, hi. That's the way it worked. Sundays, they tried to get close to Sunday with a, uh, for, for church call, where they do either singing a hymn or, or someone could remember the 20, 21st Psalm, that sort of thing, they would do it. And it just bugged them because these guys are either atheist or Buddhism, and they didn't like Christian at all. So to do church call is very simple. You'd hear one tap, that brings you on the first line. Then you hear a tap, 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 that's C, pause, tap, tap, tap. That was CC, church call. So in the different cells and different buildings, they always had one or two that were very good at this tap code. And so they were the ones that were the communicators. Now they got very ingenious. Not only could they tap it, but they could also cough it because they had upper respiratory you know, problems there from the, the, the humid uh, climate and that sort of thing. They could cough the tap code. They could, they could sign the, the tap code. They could blink the tap code. So they could be in communications to buildings across long spaces. And so that was good in that they knew what, whatever the hot item was of the day for the camp, whether it was going to be beatings or they were looking for certain information. If you're forearmed with that kind of information, you can play along with the game and keep them off balance. Remember, even though you're a POW, we were always taught this, you still resisted. That was still the enemy. And so you resisted in whatever manner you had. Do not cooperate. That's what it's all about. And so with this tap code, they were very ingenious on that. All right. Now, this is back at Sante. This is uh, John Reynolds. You barely see him here. He had his family back in 95. And he wanted to show him. He lived in Sante. And you see this one tree in front of the prisoner barracks there building? Uh, it had been pruned by our helicopter when it went in and landed. The rotor blades were, in fact, split off. So it, we couldn't have used that to come back out. And we also felt if he were under power and, and with the heavy ro rotation of the rotor blades, he'd be kicking up a lot of dust and there'd be a lot of confusion. So that's left over many years later, we think, from the, uh, the original assault. Now, are those the prison buildings on the left at that White House on the right? On the, on the left here, this is all new, build up since. Oh. Back then, it was all open area because the prison was out there by themselves. Now, talking about people um, knowing about the prison, they knew it was a government compound. They claimed they never knew there were American prisoners there because they would never see them. That's why the walls were there, not so much to keep us inside. But so they didn't know what was going on inside. And a lot of them were surprised later on they found out there were Americans being held there. They figured that was all down in Hanoi. But they actually had 10 outlying prisons around just so they felt we wouldn't bomb North Vietnam as much because we didn't know where the, but we did know where the prisoners were. We were able to figure it out. And so that's why they didn't know. Now this is again 1994. You can see with the only remaining standing wall when I was there. And it's uh, mortar and brick up, up to about eight feet. And then on top they would put down a, a, a row of uh, mortar and then they put in just broken glass all the way around. And that was to prevent people from putting their arm over to crawl out or crawl in for that matter. And they still do that today around there. It works. It's very effective. Uh, this was a, uh, they called it the prison library. What it really was was a propaganda room and they try to convince our pilots that 
the uh, communism was good and capitalism was bad. Well, now that has since, and that was fun time for our prisoners because they could they could mock the communists, you know, again resisting, and it drove them crazy, not not the prisoners. They were having fun, but but the point is now there's been a transition. So these new generations that come in and they they're they're economically minded and they're capitalists, and they are now doing capitalist things and communists is, is a back back road there for, for the back seats as far as what they're doing very interesting change and they do want the Americans to come back in there because we, uh, we we do bring uh, funds we bring know-how and uh, that sort of thing now just th this was the biggest uh, prison building it was the third one its nickname was the cat house and that was named by our, our prisoners because they could remember that. They couldn't remember Sante so much. Sante in, in prisoner vernacular was Camp Hope. They felt they had hope there. But, but they had other camps called the Garbage Pile because it really was a heap, a junk heap. And, that, and that's how they remembered. So even today, you meet a POW, so I was at Sante, well, where were you? He comes right back, he said, I was Cat House 3. That means he was the third cell in in the cat house. And so that's the way it was. It was starting to get torn up. Uh, today now that whole area is all gone. It's just some uh, concrete foundations and they've, they're, they're, they're a recycling culture. And they've taken all the bricks and whatnot they had in these buildings and converted them to, to garden fences around their gardens, made some new homes out of it, that sort of thing. Now this was outside the prison, right in front of the prison, the Commandant's residence. And it was in here that the prisoners were processed in and out of the prison. Now it looks like a duplex. It's exactly mirrored so you could have two families there if you wanted to. But if you notice, it was very, to their standards, very well maintained upkeep. It had a front porch, back porch, very nice. And that was the last picture I took because about this time, there were these individuals coming through in these uh, green uniforms. And I thought they must have been military, army. And it turned out they were police. After the raid, the government gave the police the, the prison. And so they were using it for family housing. So there I am taking pictures of where they live. That got them crazy. Again, communism, a picture is permanent. They didn't know what kind of trouble. So, and, and they were befuddled what is he doing back here? Peace is broken out, why are you here? So my interpreter came up and he was shaking, I could see it. He said, He's, we, we arrested, we're under arrest, we have to go see the police chief. And I, of course, you're kidding, no, no. There they are all standing, you know, like, come on. Got in the car, down in the center of town, Sante, the town, big two-story police station, because it's a police society, right? took me upstairs with the interpreter. It was in their interrogation room. Whitewash, a, a rickety table, and a bare light bulb, just like you'd see in a Hollywood set. I said, this is real now. I'm glad you're along. You can, you can run interference. Oh, oh, oh. He was afraid, because he knows the might of the police and the army, right? So, and, and as a nice touch on the side, as I'm looking around waiting for the police chief, I, I get to examine this minutely, right? On the, on the side of the wall, there's some red smears where somebody's head may have been pushed on the side of the wall. You, your imagination starts to run wild. And I, I, I nudged him, I said, what do you think? We have to give good answers, right? Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> he was picking up on it too. And he was, he was nervous. He was always a cool character. You know, the, the Oriental reserved, he was, he was upset, he was excited. How'd you get out of there? Well, I think I sweet talked him because the guy really did when it was all said and done. What are you doing back here? Well, I had a cover story. I could never tell him, first of all, we were on the raid because we did some damage that night. There were guns involved, put it that way. Remember softening of the towers? I said, I knew a POW that was here at one time and he knew what I was talking about. Yeah, that's prison there. He said, uh, so, and remember, this is all done very slowly because you have to go from English to Vietnamese, back to Vietnamese, back to English. So everything takes a delay 
by double the time. So, I said, I knew this POW and I promised if I was here and I let him know that I was in Hanoi, so I, so I, knew, I wanted him to know that people knew I was out here, so I couldn't disappear. That's what I was worried about, actually, just disappearing. And I tell, I tell POWs, I was the last POW in Vietnam. What? 94. Ooh. <laughs> I've never had anyone say that's not right, but that's good. I'm, I'm bugging the POWs a little bit. So anyway, uh, he said, well, you know, these are we live there now, and, and you were taking pictures. So I was quick on my feet. I came right back. I said, well, I said, I'll tell you what. When I get the film, this is before digital, when I get the film developed, I'll send you pictures. Good. Well, I still owe those pictures to this day. I didn't send them. Out of Vietnam, but right? But let you go. So, yes. And so anyway, he said in the best interest, because I was worried he was going to take the camera, and he did have the camera actually, but pull the, the film out and expose it. So all these pictures I have obviously didn't happen. So he said, no, he said, in the best interest of U.S.-Vietnamese relationship, thinking ahead, he said, you're fine. He said, just you, and he said, you're always invited to come here. He said, just stop here first and let me know so I can let my people know that we're going to be up there. Very good, good deal. And since then, people, I was the first back. I had a call one night, some guy had been back. He went back in 95. And he heard, once he got my book and saw that I was back on 94, he couldn't believe that because he said, I thought I was the first. I said, no. I said, you're number two. <laughs> so that was a fun thing there on, on the side. Wow. So they said, fine, we'll let you go and everything. And so I, I got back in and that was the best ride back into Hanoi. With, with all that going on, what could have been. Interesting development. So now, go back in time. Are you done with, with this? Are there any more slides, or can we go back to... No, there's... I, let me see here. Now, remember, I, I don't know if I mentioned why the prison was empty. You see, this is John Reynolds and his family again. You see this little area right in here? That was where the well was. It was a big hole. I never knew about it, and I didn't fall into it, thank goodness. But I found this out all later. And that's the reason why they had moved the prisoners. And John Reynolds uh, is the one that told me about it. Now, who is John Reynolds? John Reynolds was a POW. He was an F-105 pilot. He was one shoot down. So he was, I mean, he was there. This is what happened. So it's, it's what happened. You still hear people today uh, will say, well, you know, there was a lot of f flooding going on. A lot of times over there, especially North Vietnam, there were different... Uh, factions of the of the government doing different things without the other side knowing what's going on. Now I can't tell you the name of the agency there, but their initials are CIA, and they were seeding clouds up north Vietnam, and they were trying to cause flooding, disrupt the rice crop, and just maybe wash out. You know, just being harassing, and it it was working to a certain extent, but. On the banks of the river, that prison was high enough that it never threatened the prison itself. And John told me that. So you have other people saying, oh, it was because of the flooding. It wasn't. It was because that well went dry. So, so, so that's what happened there. Um, let's see here. Some of the defenses we were up against that night. That's an SA-2, surface air missile number two. Today, they're probably up at number 11 or number 12. I don't know, but they keep improving the same basic. It's a two-stage rocket, liquid propellant. That's the exhaust from the, uh, the rocket nozzle. These are control fins, fore and aft. The warhead's up on top. And it, it, uh, it was uh, Mach 2. That's twice the speed of sound. And it would go up to a range of 60,000 feet. This particular one model was the same one that uh, had shot down Gary Powers when he was going over Russia in his U-2. It was not a direct hit. They got up very close proximity, boom, they put it off balance, he had to bail out of the airplane. So that's the uh, the, the SA, the SAM-2 rocket. And they fired probably 30, we aren't sure, 30 to 40 that night once the raid started because they didn't know where, they knew something was going on, didn't know where it was, so they were just hoping to hit some, some metal tin in the process. Uh, this is a MiG-21. This is in the Hanoi Peace Garden, of all things, full of war, 
crumpled up B-52s, the Peace Garden. Uh, MiG-21, you see there's 14 stars on the snows. One star represents one shoot down of some American, right? Five stars is when you are an ace. Now, the, of, of, of the many, few, few things that all governments have agreed to, any country that has fighters has agreed five shoot downs for their fighter pilots, they're designated ace. And that's how you get that. Oh, he was an ace. That's why he was. Except the Vietnamese took it one step further. They designated them on special orders as a hero pilot, and then they got to wear a special badge. I, I, I can't find it yet. You know, I, I've got the, the basic uh, pilot wings there. Uh, but anyway, uh, that's what they did for these. So, so I looked at this, and I thought, both here in, the, in this Peace Garden, and there was also an air base right nearby in Hanoi. I went out to there, and they had maybe 25 MiGs. All of them had 15, 20, 25 stars. That's propaganda. They never shot down many of us. Our problem was the radar-controlled missiles and radar-controlled flak. That's how that happened. So no, there's no uh, ace up in, in Hanoi running around missing triple ace by one, one shoot down. Oh, and on the night of the raid, because of all that activity with those 116 aircraft, the, the Vietnamese because they thought it was a big invasion, would not launch the MiGs because they think there was something bigger going to happen. It was just the first wave. We'll save those because this, would, at that point, was their most advanced uh, fighter that they had, airplane that they had for that matter. Uh, nowadays, in fact, when I went back in 94, flew in on Air France, came in and landed at Hanoi, and off on the right-hand side was a whole line of MiGs, MiG-21s. And I had to been allowed to sit up in the in the uh, on the cockpit in the flight deck with the Air France crew, and the first thing they said when they roll is a rough runway. The guy looked around the captain and says, "You know, you Americans really bombed this runway." <laughs> yeah, we did, didn't we? We hit it too. Yeah, we know we did. I said, "What about those MiGs?" Oh, he said, "Let me tell you, all of them. There's only one that flies, the one at the very end. The rest of the MiGs support that one as far as spare parts." What a story! It's all for show. All right. This is the most dangerous thing going. It's triple A with the gun, it's flak. What makes it so dangerous? You see the wheels? It's mobile. So as you're, as you're going up, the, up there against the enemy's line, you know where there are holes in his system of defense. You go through those holes. Well, they're washing it too, so they know where there's a hole. They roll this guy in, or the next guy up the next night is surprised. He's hit by that. Now, this is the air crew that flew the lead aircraft. It was uh, Cherry One. All right, so this is the crew of Cherry One air crew. Cherry One was the name of your yes. plane on that raid? Ch was it's it just uh, for that raid? Or was yes, it? yes, that was especially for the raid. Uh, Cherry One. Which guy are you in there? Oh, they always ask that question. Now watch this. There I am. And as I like to say, if I knew I was going to live this long, I'd have <laughs> taken better care of myself. <laughs> but that's, that's uh, the whole crew. And this is a good point here. You notice this yoke up here above the crew. That is half of the Fulton Skyhook recovery system. I don't know if you can see that or not. Yes. Wow. Now, how did you get the name for the Cherry One? I never was told officially, but I think unofficially it's an Army uh, thing where they, they keep it very simple, very plain, and so the airplanes ended up with these fruit call signs. And that's, we never really used our call signs because it was all radio silence, right? And so, therefore, we didn't have to use call sign. But for, for filing flight plan purposes, we would use Cherry 1 as a call sign. But we never, uh, other than the raid, it was never never used. Uh, just that now one I make. understand your patch for this mission it has something to do with your name, Cherry now, 1? You can see the patch there with all the different fruits. There's, a, there's cherry, there's an apple, there's a lime, there's a banana. 
and there's a peach. Cherry was for the two 130s. Cherry one, cherry two. The Apple were the HH-53s, the big helicopters, and that was uh, Apple one through five. The banana was the H-3, the one that did the assault landing in the compound. Then the lime was the, uh, the two refueling 130s for just strictly uh, giving the other helicopters gas. And then the, uh, the peach were the A1s, peach one through peach five. This patch came out of that, and we, we, we called that, this is a fruit salad with a punch. <laughs> and you see it every now and then, diff different uh, reunions, uh, people have them out there. But the originals are long gone. Can't even find them on eBay. So very briefly, I'll, I'll, I'll just talk about the Fulton recovery, Skyhook recovery system. Uh, you can see that why that was on, on the airplane's nose. And if you remember the James Bond series, uh, Thunderball, they used the last scene of B-17 with this apparatus on the nose and they picked up James Bond out of a life raft in the ocean. 500 foot lift line, they made the snag and they were able to pull him aboard. I saw that uh, in the movie and at the time I said, uh, you know, thinking to myself, they've taken this James Bond thing too far, that's impossible. Three months later I'm in a C-130 making pickups with the Fulton recovery system. So it's, it's, uh, it's something that's had its use, but now uh, I've checked around with all the different crews over the years since 70. Uh, none of us ever have known the Fulton recovery system to be actually used in an operational mission. So at, along about 95, 1995, 96, the whole system was put on the shelf. It's, it's there gathering dust. And it was also the same time that they did away with the SR-71. Uh, you know, it's from World War II forward, there's always periods where they suddenly, everything is a drawdown things are economized. This was about that period in, in uh, not the mid-90s where they said we, we can't afford this anymore and so that's what that went that way. Never never to be used again but it's there for that, that purpose. Uh, the, the Ho Chi Minh Memorial gas tank. This is what I call local color. Rainbow modified. It's, it's just uh, south of Boston on uh, I-93 going north. And I don't know if you can see it or not, but there is a picture of Ho Chi Minh looking towards Boston. Uh, this was a big, white, ugly gas tank. And the, That's really supposed to be Ho Chi Minh? Yeah. I, I'll show you how it works out. Corita Kent was a nun who won the competition. The, the gas company put out all bids for the artist. Let's, let's, let's design this tank so it doesn't look like a big, white fuel tank. I think this was very clever, just a very stylized rainbow. Uh, but anyway, uh, I never got to be able to interview Corita Kent because she too must have had some baggage and committed suicide and gone. So I, I, I know what's left behind, but I don't know really what was going on there other than just an anti-war uh, protester. So if you can't see Ho Chi Minh, I've done a blown up of the blue, it's the blue band and if you still can't see Ho Chi Minh, I bring this out. You can see the forehead, eyebrows, nose, pursed lips, and the scraggly beard. Can you see it now? And this is the only moving part of the whole presentation. Isn't that wonderful? High tech at its best. That's the Ho Chi Minh Memorial Gas Tank, and it's still there. In fact, they used to have two gas tanks. They took one down and that was the one with the Ho Chi Minh original rainbow design and moved it over to the remaining tank. So it, to this day it's still there. The commuters see it every morning going north. Interesting side light. Uh, this is always a question I have just at the end to see if people are paying attention. Uh, can you name this city? As a hint I say well this when you have a lot of money you build your water towers look like Christmas tree ornaments. What I really bring out here, you see the 130 leading a couple of helicopters? This was probably five or six years ago. The name of the city is Kuwait. 
And this is getting ready to go up north uh, into Iraq and also, I think, uh, Afghanistan. But the fact is, that's a 130 leaving helicopters. What we started back then, still being used, it's the true spirit, proud tradition of the Sante POW raid. Now, if you weren't taking notes, I did after 30 years. And so this is our book, got our formation, and it's secret and dangerous. And what happens with this uh, book is what you heard as a presentation is just really the sketch of how we put it together, how we flew it, and it doesn't cover all the glitches we had associated with the raid. Like the one that sticks out in my mind most prominent, we couldn't get the number three engine started. And remember, we flew this airplane for four months. She performed flawlessly. We had the best maintenance. And, and it's one of those things I, I, I tell people, I said, if it weren't for maintenance, we wouldn't fly as an Air Force. And that's the person that's least thanked in any of this. It's, it's taken for, a, you know, they assume it, it's being done. So on the night of the actual raid, you couldn't get the number three engine? We, were, we could not get the number three engine started. And at that point, because uh, the, the other thing I did mention, we as a crew, the two crews, C-130 crews, did not know who was going to fly the lead position until about two nights before the mission was actually flown. We could fly each other's mission, A1s or the helicopters. So obviously the, the, the prime spot is, you know, it's like the lead sled dog. If you aren't the lead dog, you're not, your, your scenery never changes. And it was the same with this, and we wanted to be the lead C-130. And we were actually considered the visiting team because we came in from Germany where we were selected. The other team was the local home team in the States, and they just assumed they were going to be lead. Do you know why they chose you to be the lead? We were the best one. <laughs> Plain and simple. And I've asked them later when they said, and they, and they, they went out and flew with us. And, and I always knew, and I told the crew, I said, someone's keeping notes on us. If you guys want to lead this mission, we got to fly every time like we're flying the real mission. So someone's keeping tabs. And so that's what we did. And so when it got down the wire, we, we did not know, and suddenly they let us know. This also happened the same way with the Green Berets. There was a hundred Green Berets qualified to go on the mission, and they were actually selected and taken over to Thailand. When it was the night of the raid, they were ready to go. They chose 56 out of the 100. They just wanted the guys that they absolutely needed to go on the mission, and that's how they did that. So, so anyway, this book then covers all those glitches and, and, and how we had it, uh, you know, operate to, to work around, like the hung up uh, napalm. And, and somebody said in special ops, it'll never go the way you plan it. That's why you're special ops. So uh, with that number three engine didn't start, at the very last minute, we did an old trick that one of us remembered way back when, where you do a double starter button and provides a common ground and it goes over whatever was grounded out, picked up again, and number three turned. And we had to make up 21 minutes. We were late 21 minutes. So a typical special ops route is always zigzaggy. So if you do get behind for any reason, you don't know what it is, enemy action, plane, malfunction, you straighten it out. You go straight A to Z. And that's what we did. We made up 21 minutes, got in there at just the right time, picked up the helicopters, and then led them into North Vietnam. As I say, we'd all done this before, so there really wasn't anything new. It's just what's the next surprise and how do we deal with it? And it's one of those things you didn't dwell over. Here's what it is. Here's what we have to do. Here's how we're going to do it. Let's do it. And as a team, we could do it. Because you had all those different specialties around, scattered around that airplane, putting their inputs into how do you make the decision. Works. All right, so after the Sante raid, you were still in the service. How much longer did you stay in the Air Force? Uh, roughly another 10 years. Um, so at that, then it was peacetime. Yes. When did you get out? Uh, in, in 1984. So in that 10 years, you were, you said, off and on in Germany. What were your duties there? Off and on in Germany. Uh, let's let's rewind this back to just after the raid. Uh, we left Germany in uh, 74. 
most people would bring back uh, the Hummel figurines, you know, those mm -hmm. German figurines. I brought back the original Hummel. My wife is German. So back to the States, I'd been flying probably a little over 10 years by that time, and mostly in special ops because it, we started such well, the first ones there. And I decided with, with family and married and everything, I said, I, I got to get out of this because flying is inherently dangerous <laughs> if you let it be. And so I said, not, not, not so much for me, but just for peace of mind for the family. I said, I want to do something different because if you look uh, in professions, anyone that spends 10 years or more you've learned about everything you're going to learn and you you are now the expert in that area whatever it is whether it's plumbing flying uh, doctors physicians it's it's 10 years and that's it so I, I, I just recognize I'm at the 10 year point here what can I do differently I got into air traffic control in a tower on a radar so I was doing flying from the other end of the tube so that was very interesting. So, so where did you do that? So then uh, we, we came back to the States, went down to Biloxi, Mississippi, um, and, and uh, Keesler Air Force Base, and did the, and they've had air traffic down there for a long time, air traffic control. Uh, we were trained, just like the FAA is, except the military does it much faster and correct. And there's, there's no compromise of safety, I'm serious. And, and so we, we, and we both deal from the same uh, book of rules on air traffic control. And, and to point that out, when they had the, remember when Reagan fired all the controllers? Remember that? They walked out, he said, we'll fire you. <laughs> a, a funny to that is that's the guy, right, fired the controllers. Then later on, they name an airport after Reagan. Does that work? Anyway, uh, you, you go down there and, and you, you're trained on the rules of air traffic control. They are pretty much universal. It's, it's around the world. Air traffic control is air traffic control. Phraseology is very exact so there's no confusion, except when you get in foreign countries and English is the second language. Then there's an issue sometimes. So you finish that up, the air traffic control, that was uh, three months. And then we were assigned to uh, Wichita Falls, which was Shepard Air Force Base. And that was a year then of just officer training and air traffic control to be able to run a unit. Now keep in mind, you came out of the initial air traffic control school as a journeyman controller. You could do tower, you could do radar, and you could do en route. You went out to Shepard, and they, they had I think three or four bases at the time where the, where the officer was put through one year on that facility on, on the base to learn how to manage an air traffic control facility. And that was good because, you know, in, in a peacetime organization, you have a lot of paperwork and the way to do the office work. The control will take care of itself. You're all trained the same way. So you learn to do that and, and learn what higher, higher headquarters needed. So that was a whole new world. Wasn't boring and, and you learned and did that sort of thing. So in that process, uh, then I went out to Nellis, which is Las Vegas. That's where the Thunderbirds are. So then I became the, uh, the air traffic control officer, not only for the Thunderbirds, that's just gee whiz stuff, but we also had two full flying wings there. So you had really three with the Thunderbirds and all three had the most priority missions according to them. The rule in air traffic control, first come, first serve. You're number one out there, you'll take off number one. But within the military, there are different priorities and, and you, you get to know them and, and so it's, it, it works itself out. So ran that for a couple of years, that was interesting, working with the Thunderbirds and everybody else. So now you really know air traffic control, both from managing traffic and managing a facility. Then they bumped me up to a regional headquarters and turned around, made me an air traffic control team chief to go out and analyze air traffic control systems. So what you did there is you basically went to, in, into a facility, took it all apart to look at all the different functions, and then put it back together. Can you make something better? Can you streamline this? Is there too much over here that doesn't need to be done? 
And it's, a, it's a, I think, a healthy process. They used to call it an inspection. Well, it kind of looked on the surface like an inspection, but it really was an air traffic control analysis. You were trying to improve that system. And, and so that was interesting. And, and everybody does something a little different, even though we all have the same rule book, how you're supposed to do things. You have certain problems, issues you have to resolve. And that's where the learning takes place. And so as you go around to a bunch of bases, you know a lot of things about how those systems work. So at that point, that pretty well finished up the uh, the base, uh, the, the U.S. side of the of the uh, air traffic control, sent me back to Europe, Ramstein, and I was able to finish up there on that side. And and the long range plan, when I look back, was pilot air traffic control, and then come out and go with private industry. Well, this was just about the time the FAA was doing their first upgrade on the whole their whole air traffic control system. So I was picked up by Raytheon, sent down to Washington. I was their transportation guy there. And I was dealing with the FAA, uh, Department of Transportation also. That's, uh, that's a parent of FAA. And then watching the Hill, how it works, Congress. So it's like they say, if you, you know, don't watch how laws are made if you can't stand to watch how sausage is made. It's a blood sport down there. And, and they say on the po political side, and we've seen it all now, and it's coming out, they really are, they will stab you in the chest, not in the back. And so that's the kind of, and it, it was, for me, it was an eye-opener. I used to go down there from Pennsylvania, my home there in Greencastle. We're about an hour, 15 away. I love Washington because all the museums, all of them are there. Aviation, American history, art galleries, wonderful. Now I'm back there working. A place changes its, its nature and, and, and uh, its customs there when you're working versus just a tourist. But it was still good because it was a, a wonderful place to, and you, and you can see, they call it inside the beltway. You were about two months ahead of outside the beltway because things are happening inside. As you make your rounds, you're hearing what's going on, you have an idea what's going to happen. And by the time it actually happens, it's two months later, you've already known about it, and the rest of the country finds out about it. It's, it really is that way. Bill, do you recall your last day in service? Were you in Germany? Well, let me, I'm going to give you a double answer. As a pilot, first and always, I remember my last landing. And I remember my first landing. Because the instructor, when I was landing at Nashville International, I'm in the seat, instructor's in the seat, he says, go land it. And I'm used to pilot training yet, where they, they walk you through and show you everything is done. Just said, go land it. We're flying. You, yeah, go ahead and land I said, Did you show, he said, are you a pilot? You know, walking me down 20, yes I am. I said, well, you can land this in. Oh, all right. And then I realized it's all about you and adjusting to the airplane. So that was my first landing, right into to Nashville. And uh, my last landing was at Frankfurt, Rhine Mine. And I knew it was my last. You know, they, they say there's, there's two times in a, a pilot's career. When he goes out to pre-flight the airplane, he either knows that's his last landing, or he doesn't know that's his last takeoff, because he's had an accident somewhere in between. So I knew this was it, you know, no more flying, got to go back to the States, air traffic. So the last landing was in busy Frankfurt, that's the second busiest base. And we came in and rounded out, rounded out, nice, skinned it right on, squeaker, rolled off, said, well, that's it. And that was it. Hung it up. And you have Long oh, I have, but private. Yeah. You know, different, different, different models. Friends have planes. Uh, I've, I've got gotten lucky just getting on rides. I've, I've been able to up on the different 130 flight decks, and that's 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 like going back to the office. And that that always uh, it doesn't change. It really doesn't. Yeah. So my last day in the office, so to speak, I actually retired uh, at McGuire Air Force Base in New Jersey. They don't do retirements overseas. You have to come over to a stateside base. And so that was there just uh, enough to clear up the paperwork, 
uh, we had to pick up a car, Bayonne, New Jersey, and it was like two days and that was it. And then you start the resume game. Then you're a civilian again. What's that? Then you're a civilian again. Exactly, exactly. And there's, there's no, uh, no transition. It's just, you know, you go out that front gate and you're now uh, Mr. Gunn in there. Wow. <laughs> so that was good. Bill, how would you say that your military experience affected your life? Oh, positively, uh, and, and for the right, all the right reasons. I, I think, first of all, today, I think everyone, male and female, should have some kind of military training just for two years. You say, why? Because you suddenly now realize you've been in a, a spoon-fed environment, school, university, whatever, people are trying to take care of you. The military, you suddenly realize they're not that way anymore. It's up to you, it gives you confidence, it gives you gumption, and you realize this is all serious now. This isn't just a nice, happy environment on the campus, whatnot. And, and so you, you, you pick up discipline. You know, getting up at the, the, uh, the old dark 30, that's all about discipline. And, and you know, you don't want to, but you trudge along. You gotta show up uh, and you gotta make the roll call and all the rest of that. I think that is very healthy. You look at the countries around the world that have at least two-year mandatory. They're different. They think different. You know, I'm, I'm very familiar with Germany, obvious reasons. Right now, their economy is probably the best in the world. It's better than ours. And I, when I was, I was just over last year, and I asked that question, cousins and relations, I said, what, what's different here? And they, they brought it to light, and I realized a German is driven to be compliant and, and do what has to be done the best he can do. Quality. Quality. I go into stores in Germany, pick up stuff that's there, made in Germany. Not made in China, not made in Japan, made in Germany. There's a pride thing there. And that's why I think they're, they're good at what they're doing. And that's what I think, you said, going back to the military question, I think that's what makes people suddenly realize uh, this is really serious and it's up to you as an individual to be motivated to do what you have to do. The military puts that in. Or you turn out to be a real loser. And we know the other things that happen on that. So that's why I think uh, it, it was the, the luckiest, smartest thing I could have done. It was only because I wanted to go fly. Not because, and I don't think I'm a good military person. Have you ever heard that? From interviews? Uh, it's too regimented, and remember, it's, it's designed to take care of the lowest common denominator. And so, the weak light bulb there has to be told specific, especially, I'm not picking on the Army, but it, it works out the Army, hey, it's raining, get in the truck, and then get in the truck, right? Where the Air Force, hey, it's raining, <laughs> we're getting in the truck, and we're driving to some place. <laughs> it's that kind of mentality. So. The military, and especially higher up, uh, and I think you asked me earlier, do you ever come across people in the military? Yeah, you do, because they're, they're almost protected, uh, where they can't be themselves. They, they have to go the party line. It's very political in the military. And, and the lower rankers get the short end of the stick. They, they're the ones that have to carry it out. I used to say, if politicians had to serve in the trenches, we would not have wars. And I, I think that, that applies across the board in just about anything. Nowadays, they, they're not real generals per se, they're politicians. And of course, the military, by design, the Constitution, works for the commander-in-chief. If there's a disconnect there, they get generals in there who make the connection back, and they're going that way and not so much taking care of the troops. A real good leader takes care of the troops first. He's done, they have done what the troops have done at one time. So there's respect there. You earn that respect. Bill, uh, before we end, I just wanted to add uh, one thing about, I know you've had, I, I took a picture of it, we'll include this record, um, you collect wings. Um, can you just tell me briefly how you started that and, and why you continue to do that? Yes, I can. Um, 
it's a very simple thing, a wing. You hear about it, you know pilots get wings, they earn their wings, and you do earn your wings, they aren't given to you. As I was making the travels around the world, I realized there's a lot of wings out there. And so when I was still flying, I was different officers club, whatever, I would trade wings, that was a big thing. And so it just one of those things that took off on its own. What was your first wing? Mine, the one I earned. Air Force wing. And probably the first uh, other than my own wings was uh, the, uh, I remember one from Spain, because they had a propeller in the center of their wing, you know, the regular wing across and the propeller. And, and the deal was <coughs> you go up to the, the wing there on his, on his uh, blouse, you would, you would flip the propeller and it would spin. Wow. <laughs> yeah. You want to hold that up? So wings, I, I wanted to say something, there's, there's millions of wings. Out at San Diego at their Air and Space Museum, when you first go in on the right wall, uh, the right hand side, the first room on the wall, there are three full, I would call the size of a uh, plywood, sheet of plywood. Three of those full of wings from all over the world, air forces, airlines, private, all the wings. I, I could sit there and just look at that and that's when I realized through the years my different shoe boxes are filling up with wings. So what I've done here, these are just some of the more recent that I have that are, that are different. You can see just looking at that, the different wings and the different material. Some wings are made of metal, some wings are cloth, for so on, and some wings are what they call bullion, and that's a metallic thread of either gold or silver. Uh, I have one on here. It's the uh, Air France, this one right here. And you see it's very simple, you got the wings, but then you had the, the red, white, and blue sash across the globe. That's Air France. I got that from an Air France captain who is a senior captain who is checked out on the new Airbus 380. And we got to talk English. By the way, English is the, uh, is the international aviation language. So that everyone understands as much as they can, even though it's a second language for the rest of the world. Uh, he broke out in good English. We were talking. I said, I'd like your wings. Oh, well, I, you know, and he was in uniform. And so I said, well, I always, and I always travel with a couple of pair of wings, my own wings for trading. So we traded, and that's how I have these uh, Air France wings, bullion, which you can see it's made of thread and not metal so much. Wow. It's, like, it's like embroidered, yeah. I guess you'd call it that. So it catches on, it lingers, and, and you just there's never enough wings to have. So that's, that's a spinoff from being an Air Force pilot. Bill, is there anything else that you'd like to add that we haven't covered in this interview? I, I don't think so. You, you've you've uh, opened up a lot of uh, things I haven't thought about in a long time. Uh, and, and the reason now, you know, as you, as you age, you wonder why you did these things. And I, I got to say, I'm glad I did. It was it just, it was a fluke uh, of what happened. And, and as the things line up, going forward, there is no real master plan. But as you look back, you realize because of what you like to do, that kind of guided where you ended up doing. And so I guess, uh, I, I guess the answer to that as far as a takeaway is, is uh, don't sweat the big things or the small things. They'll take care of themselves. Just be happy in what you do. Pick something you like to do. And it's not so much a nine to five job. So I'd like to thank you for your service to our country and thank you for this interview. Well, thank you. I appreciate that and, and thank you for the interview.